horror fans. Fangoria Fright Fest presents eight killer flicks. Full of thrills and chills. Blood and guts. Murder and mayhem. Fangoria Fright Fest. Horror films are, in general are about the terror of en entering adulthood because you think adulthood is actually evil. <laughs> he has written, directed, and produced some of the most disturbing movie images of all time. For over three decades, he has challenged, manipulated, and entertained his audiences. This is Wes Craven. In his words, told to Fangoria's Tony Timpone, this is his screamography. A product of a strict Baptist upbringing, Craven had a difficult childhood, but one that shaped him into the icon he is today. My father died when I was a kid, and I was raised by this other family uh, during the day while my mother was working. And that guy, his name was Eddie Bilton, um, had an eight millimeter camera and was always taking eight millimeter films. And he also would rent them from uh, the camera shops in those days, he used to rent little eight millimeter features like, uh, you know, daredevils and all that stuff. So I was really fascinated by it, but I never thought of making them. And as you said, I, um, we were forbidden to see films. So with the exception of Walt Disney films. Um, and I think it all just hit me at once um, after I got out of graduate school. I, uh, I had seen uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I had actually snuck out of uh, the college that I was going to that would have uh, expelled me for going to the movies. I mean, it, looks, it all sounds insane now, but uh, and I, I thought the film was so fantastic. I, you know, it just was like, well, this can't be sinful. This is stupid. You know? That forbidden trip to the theater made an impact on Craven, which would stay with him to this day. I don't know. I, think, I always think that being raised the way I was raised gave me more, um, certainly gave me a great love of film because they were forbidden. And that, that always, you know, if you were, forbid anybody to do anything, then it's like, that becomes really a, a great thing to do. But also, um, it, it made me literate, you know, rather than uh, steeped in films. So I kind of have a very, I think, a deep story sense because I just read books up until the time I was in my mid-twenties, you know. Um, but, that, you know, I'm sure I have a, a, a bit of rage in me, probably a good deal of it, just of uh, what was taken from me, uh, you know, by being raised in a group that said the world is sinful, you don't want to be part of it, sex is bad, you can't dance, you can't smoke, um, that kind of stuff. When you look back on it, you, you, uh, you realize that that kind of fundamentalistic way of looking at the world really isolates people from life itself. I totally understand why fundamentalist uh, Islamicists can do what they do because, you know, it's, it, it's crazy making, you know. It makes you feel like you're not where you actually are. It took some time for Craven to figure out where he wanted to be. After I got out of grad school, I was teaching, and they had an, an art house in the town, and it was right in the middle of the European New Wave. So, you know, all those films by uh, Fellini and Bunuel and Truffaut, and, you know, that incredible, incredible outburst of fantastic creativity, you know. And I just fell in love with it. I just, I, I, I want to make films, you know. And I didn't really have an idea of what kind of films to make at all. I, I think I still had my head up my butt, you know, as far as what reality was or anything, because I'd come from this very kind of tight, narrow little background. So there was a lot of just taking big leaps of faith, you know, quitting my job and even going to graduate school. I didn't have money to go to graduate school, but I just hitchhiked there and, and got a couple scholarships, you know, within three days. And so I'd, there's been about four or five key moments in my life where I've just kind of like, here we go, <laughs> you know, because it just felt like nothing's going to happen if I'm still teaching up in upstate New York, and you know, nothing's going to happen if I don't quit my job teaching, and uh, you know, and it worked out. So I, I, I think sort of passion and kind of uh, you know bold moves like that are very very important. It was not only his risky moves that got him on his way, but the friendships he made that would turn out to have a great impact on his career. I have a lucky break. There was a guy who was a, the big brother of a student of mine, um, Harry Chapin, who later went on to write Taxi and become a very famous uh, kind of urban folk singer. But 
at that time he was in film and so through his brother I got linked up with him and he taught me just the basics uh, of how to cut. So that was really invaluable. I, w I, I wasn't making any money but um, I learned how to basically edit on a flatbed and then uh, somebody in that facility where he was cutting um, fired their messenger, a 16 year old kid and asked her if he had a, Harry if he had a cousin or nephew or something and I said I'll do it. So <laughs> that was my first job after college professor was a, was a uh, a messenger for a post-production house. But uh, you know, very quickly worked my way up. It was a very small company and I was assistant manager in a year. And then um, I quit and because I didn't want to become the businessman side, you know. Craven's passion was to be the creative type. So yet again, he made another bold move to get him on his way. So I started looking for jobs and I was driving a cab in New York and thinking maybe I'd blown my career, my life, everything else completely in debt, selling everything. Um, and I got a job on a small film, Thinking of Dailies, uh, and met this guy, Sean Cunningham. It turned out to be a lifelong friendship. And um, I worked for him, and I just kept moving up, kind of in the, uh, up the ladder, of, because there was only Sean and one other guy. At the end of that particular film, Sean and I were friends, and he said, I've got some guys with $90,000. They want to make a scary movie. You want to write a scary movie? If they like it, you can direct it. And that is how it happened. I knew nothing about uh, making scary films. Uh, I don't think I had even seen a horror film. So it was just one of those weird things where you look back and say, well, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> you know? But it's just the way life goes sometimes. And this is when Craven's life began to change. And he would soon realize all his bold moves were about to pay off. So I always tell you know, kids, just take any job you can uh, to get in the door of a film of a place where people are either working on movies in post or making movies, whatever, or even work for nothing, just because it's all about context. It's all about meeting people. And in that case, it was just meeting Sean Cunningham, a guy who was willing to uh, say, you know, we'll be partners on this. And you'd only know me for a year and started off just hiring me, you know, so. Their first collaboration was 1972's infamous Last House on the Left. Yeah, Bergman's Virgin Spring was, uh, you know, obviously the basis of, uh, of The Last House on the Left. I always say that Virgin Spring was based on a, a medieval, um, uh, they were called lays, not what they sound like, but they were, uh, you know, songs with stories. So it's, it's a pretty ancient um, kind of uh, metaphor for, you know, getting the experience of life the hard way. Two girls on a pilgrimage and um, one is one is murdered and one gets away for a while, kind of the wilder girl. And they're, uh, the shepherds who kill them, um, which happens kind of accidentally, they really rape them. And then they end up killing them almost out of shame or whatever it is. It's very unclear all the moralities. And, and anyway, they take shelter uh, in the parents' house of the girls they've just killed without even knowing it. And the parents in the middle of the night discover <clears throat> the bloody clothes of one of the girls and realize what's happened. And, uh, you know, through the course of the night, prepare to kill these men and then do kill them in the, in the house. So uh, I just thought that was a fantastic story. A story that was considered one of the most disturbing movies of its time. Well, I wasn't comfortable with, um, you know, with the viciousness in the real world. So I think, uh, you know, doing a story with viciousness in it was like, this is what I'm talking about, you know. So it was kind of a subversive thing in the sense of, um, Rather than doing violence that's entertaining, we'll do violence that's appalling, you know, and is happening to real people and being done by people who, even a few moments after they do it, are nauseated at what they've done themselves, uh, and then try to clean up and you know wash the blood away, but they can't, and they have nightmares about it, even as they're sleeping in the house of the parents of the girls they killed. So it's like <clears throat> all of this kind of. There are no uh, black and whites here, it's all gray. You know, the parents, respectable couple, but they plan really murder within a very short time, you know, and carry it out. So um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't being comfortable with it. In fact, it was just the opposite. It was doing uh, violence that you weren't comfortable with. I remember the scene where uh, Phyllis dies uh, and they are stabbing her so many times they disembowel her without even realizing and then stop. And that's kind of where they're up you know, just revolted by what they've done. Um, we shot that in, in one morning, and um, you know, there had been a sort of a tone on the set of 
as Sean used to say, laughing and scratching, which is often when you're making a horror film and doing the bloodiest stuff, everybody's kind of giggling because there's this sort of exuberance from playing in mud and, and doing the forbidden and everything else. But after that scene, uh, we broke for lunch and nobody touched the food. Everybody just went off by themselves, including myself. And it was very interesting because it was just, for the first time we realized that what we're doing stuff just is real in a strange way. It was just felt chillingly real and, and uh, repulsive. And that's, you know, that's what it was. Cunningham and Craven's next effort was to get Last House that elusive R rating. But with a story so violent and so intense, this would not be easy. You know, it's funny, because Sean and I uh, delivered Last House to um, the boys in Boston, as we call them. It was, I, we thought they might be mafia, but they were theater owners in, in Boston, and uh, they had outdoor theaters, about 100 of them. And they're the guys that financed the film. And, uh, you know, we, we shipped it off, and we thought, well, we'll show up in Boston, we'll never hear from it again, and we'll go on with our lives. And then we got this call saying, uh, you know, you won't fucking believe this. They're lined up around the block, and we've got riots, and somebody had a heart attack, and they're attacking the projection booth. And, you know, and it went on and on and caused this huge sensation. But we had no idea that that was going to happen. And then Sam Markoff heard about it and bought it and put it out nationally. So it was funny because it was something that we just kind of tossed off and thought none of our friends would see, and suddenly we were completely identified with it. And uh, all of our friends started keeping their children away from us and stuff like that. It was funny. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the censorship on, it's interesting because um, I didn't know anything, I didn't know the MPA existed, you know, when I made that film. And Sean knew it and he said, we have to send it off now and get it censored. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And he said, no, there's this place in California, we have to send the film in order for it to be released. And I said, I can't believe this. So we sent it off and they, you know, we got this appalled letter back saying, you have to cut the entire ending, you have to cut this scene and that scene, and we started cutting it down and sending it back, and each time they said, you have to cut more and more and more. Finally, it was just to the point where we'd have to cut the whole film in half. And Sean said, basically, screw it. So he, uh, he said, put it all back, put it all back. And uh, we went across the street where we're having the blow-up done, and said, do you have a, you know, the negative for an R rating, you know, the, the blue screen with the R on it? And I said, yeah. So we'll put it on the front of ours. And that's how it got an R rating. I mean, it was totally illegal. We're past the statute of limitations now. But, and so it was put out as an R rated film, but it was completely X rated, really. And uh, there was a point, I think, about two weeks into its running when there were so many riots and so many people cutting it up and you know, trying to get out the projection booth and everything that we, um, we did some cuts. I actually, I did it just by telephone because I was at that time uh, in California and Sean had somebody snip away some of the stuff that was out for 20, 25 years until we finally, uh, I had kept the stuff. And we put it back in for the uh, un, uncut version. You know. Craven was now making a name for himself in Hollywood, even if many had the wrong idea of him. I don't know, you walk into an office and, and everybody goes, oh, you're Wes Craven, you know? Uh, I expected, and then it's like Charles Manson. Well, yeah, kind of. It's like everybody thinks that anybody that does, does this kind of film is really bent out of shape, is really weird, have horrible thoughts all the time. Um, and so they would never ever think of using that person to do anything but that kind of horrible film. So um, yeah, after the last house, both Sean and I tried to do other kinds of things and I wrote comedies and everything else, and, which is stuff I had been writing all the way from junior high school. I had written much more comic material than anything else and nobody wanted to know about it. But, it was always, but if you want to do a horror film, we'll give you money. So we held out, both of us held out for about four years, and then we were broke, and uh, another friend of mine, Peter Locke, uh, said, I've got money if you want to do a scary film, so I wrote uh, The Hills of Eyes, and I went off and did that, and Sean maxed out all of his credit cards and uh, you know, wrote, uh, or had somebody write Friday the 13th for him, and went from being you know, in debt to everybody to being, you know, a millionaire, so it's all those weird reversals that happen that you just can't predict. But I, I many times in my career, I've tried to get away from horror. It's, it just keeps dragging me back. Uh, I suddenly realize horror films are great, and I have real talent for it, so stop complaining and just make really good ones. Craven finally embraced his talent and continued to make films that made his fans 
face their fears. Well, the inspiration for Hills of Eyes was Peter Locke called me up and he was always after me to write a film. He says, listen, I'm out here in Vegas. My wife at that time was a, a singer, dancer, comedian, Liz Torres. And she's playing Vegas and uh, you know, there's all this desert out there and nobody cares where you go, so why don't you write something for the desert? <laughs> okay, fine. Um, and I went to the New York Public Library and was going through their um, sociology division just looking at crime books and I found uh, the story of the Shawnee Bean family from 1600s in uh, Scotland and it was a family that had gone wild, um, ran around naked and uh, attacked wayfarers, people going between uh, Glasgow I believe and London and uh, pulling them off their horses and eating them and their horses and so people would go on this particular route and just be banished, you know. One character from The Hills Have Eyes will forever stay with Craven. Yeah, I certainly just uh, years and years of people say, oh, who was that bald guy, you know? You know that that was just a key stroke of luck and casting. Uh, Michael walked in to the office. We were a, a little tiny room off Sunset Boulevard, off a parking lot, and Peter and I just looked at each other and said, oh, you're hired, <laughs> you know? You'll be uh, Pluto. So. Um, yeah, because he, he was just, no prosthetics, he was just scary looking, you know, and uh, Michael, he says, I got 24 uh, birth defects, so, you know, I don't have any sweat glands, I don't, I don't have much hair, I don't have fingernails, I, you know, he had no, practically no body fat, he had a misshapen head, and we just put him out there, no makeup, it was, uh, and he was just so scary, and he was the first one of them that you saw, I mean, everybody was just chilled in that. That carried you through the rest of the film. The film really put Craven and his crew to the test. It was only my second, I think Peter's second. He had done some tiny film, and, and neither one of us knew diddly squat about shooting a desert or even being west of the Mississippi. I mean, you know, we were both New Yorkers, basically. And uh, the first time we went out location scouting with Bob Burns, our production designer, we rented a car in something like Barstow, and a nice air-conditioned car rental place. And got in the car, turned the air-conditioning on, started following these Bureau of Land Management, you know, maps, cut off into the dirt roads. And then the guy said, you know, don't get, don't get off the main road, you know. People die out there all the time. We're like, oh, yeah, sure. So then we, you know, found these dirt roads and drove, 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 and like two hours out in the middle, and we're like, I can't believe there's a place like this in the United States. There's nothing you can see for miles, you know. And then we, I said, well, let's get out. So we stopped the car and you know, turned off the engine and got out. And it was like stepping out into a furnace. It was just incredible. So we're like walking around, drinking all of our water and everything else and finished, you know, finished the last water and got back in the car. And the car, which was now 200 degrees inside, wouldn't start. And we just looked at each other and said, we've done exactly what they told us not to do and now we're going to die, you know. So fortunately, after we let the car cool down and it started. but. Um, the whole thing was just kind of an, exp you know, learning what it was like to shoot there by just doing it. And uh, it was up to 120 degrees during the day and down into the 40s at night, you know, and just, we were miserable all the time, you know, physically, but it was exhilarating to be doing the shooting. But, you know, there were rattlesnakes and there were scorpions and then tarantulas and all that stuff, like the tarantula scene, we just had, you know, it was a tarantula walking through the set. We just grabbed it and I said, put it on in his coat, you know, so when Lynn gets to, goes to get her husband's coat, there's the spider. It was just like stuff we were discovering ourselves. The heat of the desert could not compare to the stink of this swamp thing. Uh, I got to see Adrian Barbeau topless. I guess that was the high point. Um, it was a very difficult shoot. Uh, we had a completion bond company that was on the set all the time uh, and were really nasty. So um, you would constantly be told to wrap it up, wrap it up, you know. So very little coverage and, and the whole last two weeks was just, we shot basically masters and they think, okay, move it on or we're shutting you down. So <laughs> that was horrible. Um, we were working in swamps that were full of alligators uh, and usually up to our bib, you know, coveralls, we had these waders uh, and they were just crocs or alligators going by like they were commuting, you know. But nothing happened. There were so many of us, I think the alligators were like, I wish they'd go away so I could have my swamp back. You know? But it was, it was very uncomfortable. It was extremely hot and muggy, uh, and there was, a, there was a, some sort of plague of black caterpillars, so they were constantly falling out of trees and going down your neck and stinging you, and there were 
deer flies all the time, and there were a lot of water moccasins we had to watch out. So all that stuff was really, it was really, it was pretty damn difficult to shoot, actually. <laughs> Finally leaving the swamp, Craven moved to suburbia and began his greatest film achievement. Yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street was inspired by, um, I think, three articles in the LA Times over a period of about a year and a half. Um, the first one was kind of sketchy, and it was the story of a, a, of a young man dying um, after having a severe nightmare, and they couldn't figure out how it happened medically. And then there was a second story about nine months later, and nobody, the newspaper didn't seem to correlate it. They didn't seem to remember the other story. And then the third story, and the one that really made me feel that I have to write a script about this, was um, this kid. All these kids were Asian, all of them were Southeast Asia, all had come out of uh, kind of war zones from Vietnam and, and Pol Pot, the, you know, the culling fields. And their families had gone through location camps and then it ended up in the United States. Um, this kid was having nightmares and he said, somebody's after me in my nightmare. If I sleep, I know I'm going to die. And his, his father was a physician. Um, and he said, I'll give you sleeping pills, you'll be all right. We've come through a horrible time, now we're in America, you're safe. Uh, and uh, the father started giving the kid sleeping pills and the kid supposedly was taking them. But he stayed up and he stayed up for something like five days. It was like an amazing, just you know, keeping himself awake almost by putting matchsticks in his eyes. <clears throat> and then finally he fell asleep while the family was watching television. And they took him upstairs and put him in bed and uh, the parents later said, that, you know, we are all convinced that crisis was over and um, in the middle of the night they heard screaming and thrashing and ran into his room and he was like kicking and screaming and they got to him and he just fell dead and he was dead and uh, there were three things that really just made me think this is a movie one was they did an autopsy on him and nothing was wrong there was no physical reason for it and the second was that they found the family said they found all the sleeping pills that supposedly he had taken uh, hidden, so he had obviously put them in his mouth and when dad wasn't looking it was right back out because he didn't want to sleep. And the third thing was this incredible thing, this kid had run an extension cord behind his bedroom curtains and into the closet and he had a Mr. Coffee in there with black coffee. So he had a source of keeping awake even when he was in his room supposedly sleeping. And it was just so, it was heartrending because this kid, he was right, you know. He died as soon as he fell asleep. Craven once said, Horror films don't create fear, they release it. And Freddy released a lot of fear with his fans. Freddy was based on, um, I think it was based on a man who scared me when I was a little kid. Um, you know, again, my father was dead. There was always this sense that I had of it, like nobody's around to really protect us, you know, because um, dad's gone. And uh, <clears throat> I, I just was lying in my bed. We had, we're in a second story apartment. And, Heard this guy sort of mumbling, grumbling, and shambling along. And once it went down, it was this guy, kind of dressed like Freddy, you know, dark jacket, the sort of brimmed hat that they wore in those days. And he stopped and somehow just looked straight up at me. You know. And um, I was just, I was so scared, you know, I just like jumped back and I was back in the shadows waiting for the sound of him going away. And I waited, waited, it seemed like I waited forever. And finally, thought, well, he must have gone. And, so I went back to the window and he was there and he just went, you know, and then he started walking down the sidewalk looking over his shoulder at me like, <clears throat> and he went into our building. So I don't know who that guy was, but he became Freddy. My brother went down with a baseball bat and the guy ran away. So um, I guess my big brother saved my life. Who knows? He might have just thought I'll, I'll scare this kid for the hell of it, you know. So that, that became the basis of Freddy, just the, sort of an adult that took delight in terrifying a child was the basis of it. And then um, the rest was actually a quite intellectual process of uh, uh, what, what will he wear? And I thought, you know, like an overcoat would be good. And, and then I thought of the idea of a janitor. So because, you know, I had taught Greek mythology and the descent into Hades was always going down and fire. and so made his job basically being in Hades, you know. And the, the sweater, the striped sweater, was a Scientific American article on the two colors that are the most difficult for the human retina to see side by side. So <laughs> that was those colors. Um, and the, there were a lot of films being made with villains that had masks, but I wanted him to be able to talk, so I said instead of a hockey mask or whatever, 
I'll give them a mask of scar tissue, and that'll be the way their parents kill them. And the final thing with the claws was, um, you know, we went through the usual thing of, shall it be a hunting knife? Shall it be, uh, you know, a, a scythe? Should it be, you know, all this crap? And so I said, well, no, go back to the most primal weapon you can think of. And I thought, well, uh, it would be tooth and claw, you know, what men faced before they had real weapons. And then I thought, well, cave bears, you know, that claw that can come in and grab you. And then combining that with the human hand, uh, you had kind of the elements of both the ancient and the new, uh, you know, highly evolved, dexterous thing that makes humans so incredibly unique is our hands, you know. Um, so putting those two things together just made, made something that was pretty powerful. <laughs> Freddy is still one of the most feared movie characters of all time. It's funny, Freddy, originally I was thinking uh, he should be a guy in his 70s. And we looked at a lot of, you know, older gentlemen and they, you know, I think if you get to be 70, you're kind of like mellow. You know, you've, got, you've seen it all and you're just grateful to be alive and, and life has a lot more kind of preciousness to it. And so, uh, and then Robert Englund came in and it was like, not this guy, you know, he's too young. And he just had such an enthusiasm for it. And I, I'd found that and then we looked at a lot of big stuntmen too, and I found stuntmen were very, also very gentle people in general, that they, they were so in control of their body and physicality, they didn't have these issues, you know, that people that are a little bit more normal and, you know, were beat up as kids or whatever. And Robert Englund just had no hesitation to play something really evil. And I realized that that was what it took. It didn't take an old guy, it didn't take a big guy. It took somebody who was comfortable, you know, looking inside and saying, what would I be like if I was utterly evil? And a lot of people can't do that, you know. They don't want to go there, so they'll play it kind of bold, you know, kind of too big, or they'll kind of do a jokey. But you know, Robert was willing, at least in the first one, to be serious, and that's what worked. It works so well that Nightmare on Elm Street has grossed over twenty-five million dollars to date. Horror films are, in general, are about the terror of en entering adulthood because you think adulthood is actually evil. <laughs> or at, at best incompetent, you know. Uh, and, and almost every horror film, the, the adults are either, you know, in league to kill you, or they are uh, incompetent, like the sheriff, the bumbling cop, the, you know, the, the person that tells you, go to bed, when you know if you go to bed, you're gonna die. So, and it's, there, it's about that transition into adulthood and leaving childhood behind. So, uh, you know, that's an important thing for, uh, for horror films is that kind of um, the adults that, you know, um, in some way have uh, sold their souls, you know, or are incompetent to deal with what you know. And I think as a child, a child adult, if you can put yourself in that sort of 12 to 17, 18 year old period, you don't, you're not sure you're going to be able to hack it as an adult. You don't want to be a child anymore, but you've got all those memories of vulnerability and the family struggles. And, you know, not mom not being able to come with you in your dreams, all those sort of things. And, and then there's sex that's starting to become an issue and you don't know what the hell all that's about and how you're gonna do. And so there's a lot of real primal things that are going on in that five year, six year, um, you know, um, sort of pre and post puberty teen period there that's really powerful. And there's no real guidelines uh, that you can take from adults, uh, and increasingly so because each generation is so remarkably different from the previous ones. So, uh, you know, adults are just kind of like, um, it's a period where you kind of have to kill the adults almost, you know. My theory is that when you do a horror film, it's almost like you construct a very complex character that has all sorts of things hanging off of him or her, you know, the past and what mom thought. And, you know, what their friends think you should do and everything else, and one by one you kill them. And it sounds like you're just a butcher, but what really, if you look at it in a mystical sense, you're actually stripping away parts of a personality or persona that don't work. You know, the parental attitude that, oh, we'll just follow the rules, get rid of that. You know, you get rid of it until you end up with this core persona, the hero or the heroine, that knows exactly what's going on, still has goodness, but is able to kick ass and take names and stays awake, you know, and that's what it's all about. And I think that is, that is the template that kids unconsciously are looking for. How do I get through the worst 
hell I can imagine, or the worst hell that I think the world might throw at me after watching the evening news. You know, what would I do if I was tortured? What would I do if somebody threatened to cut off my head? I mean, just open the New York Times. You know, it's there all the time. So I think kids are always wondering, like, how do I, how do I survive in this world of adults that seems to be quite maniacal and crazy and, and full of uh, duplicity and we're really nice people and at the same time we're killing people, you know. That's, that's pretty heady stuff for a kid to figure out. After Nightmare on Elm Street, Craven created some more notable films to his credit. The Serpent and the Rainbow, The People Under the Stairs, and Shocker. But Shocker didn't cause too much of a jolt at the box office. It's humbling that, you, you know, when you do something really fantastic like, you know, Nightmare on that goes on and on and on, and you say, okay, I'll just do another one, and it doesn't always happen, you know, for a hundred reasons. I mean, uh, sometimes it's casting, sometimes, in the, in the case of that one, the guy who was in charge of special effects went crazy in the middle of the shoot, and uh, he kept saying, the, the special effects are coming, they're coming, I'm going to give them to you all at once, and then he finally came to me in tears and said, ah, I don't know what's happening, I can't think, and I haven't done any of them, and it doesn't work, and I'm so sorry, and he started sobbing, you know. And I, I sent my son to get the negative from him, and he didn't know where any, any of it was, and then we had like a three-week search for negative, and we were finding it under benches in the labs with no, you know, no labeling, they found some in the trunk of his car, it was insane. So all that was going on while we were trying to make a movie, so yeah, it's like, you never know what's gonna happen in, in the course of any given film, you know, whether the gods are gonna be with you or not. So all the, all the, a lot of the special effects of uh, Pinker, Horace Pinker going into you know, the electrical field and so forth were um, severely, uh, severely compromised by the fact that one major part of the infrastructure of the filmmakers was, it just fell apart. <laughs> That's the way it is, you know, it's like a, it's a big crapshoot every time you make a movie and you, know, you never know what's gonna happen. That's what makes it so much fun though. Then in 1995, Craven did the movie Vampire in Brooklyn with one of Hollywood's A-list stars. But Eddie Murphy had his own ideas for the film. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I don't want to get in trouble with Eddie. Um, he he de definitely, um, he, um, he didn't want to be really evil, uh, which I think hampered it because it really needed somebody who could, could be evil. But he'd, he kind of wanted to do a horror film, but he didn't want to be a bad guy. Uh, and he wanted to look kind of buff all the time. And, uh, you know, at that time, he was just kind of into being a leading man. It was funny because the very next film, he let all of it, you know, let his hair down completely and, you know, played the clumps or whoever that family was and it was brilliant. So, um, but it was very difficult. And there were a lot of members of his family involved and some talented, some not. And so we're fighting that all the time. And, um, there were a lot of other things that I won't talk about, but there were just there was just kind of personality and psychological stuff going on that didn't help. And the studio wanted us to do it in the back lot, so that was kind of limiting too. Um, I thought it was a good, a fun little film, and it was nice to get a chance to do comedy. But I think the script really uh, hampered it, you know. Then in 1996, Craven reinvented the teen horror genre with a huge commercial success of Scream. You know, I read the opening of Scream and it was just brutal and I thought, I can't kill another poor girl, you know, geez. You know, you do have to go into a dark place in your mind when you do these films, you know. Um, and it always seems like it's going to be a lot worse than it is because actually when you do it, it it's this, as I was saying earlier, it's a strange experience of quite often it being fun. Uh, not that you're killing people, but you're dealing with these horrible things in a way that you're in control and everybody gets very close on a horror set for some reason. So, um, you know, I thought, I thought it was, uh, maybe I shouldn't go back there and then at a certain point. I think there was a little kid at a convention, one of the, an appearance I made, and he says, you know, uh, I swear he was like 14 years old, I, I've seen all your films, but Last House, you really kicked ass. You should kick ass again. <laughs> he walked off. And I thought of that kid, I thought, well, damn, you know, okay, I'll kick ass one more time. <clears throat> and that's literally how I decided to do it, thank God. And he did it in a way that brought horror and humor brilliantly together. I, I think horror films are, uh, or at least the kind I make, are kind of black, black humor. You know, it's, it's kind of uh, making jokes about the graveyard and disease. And, I mean, all jokes are about things that we're profoundly uneasy with, you know. They're about religion and 
mother-in-laws and doctor telling you you have six days to live and race. You know, they're always about things that are really disturbing. They build up a lot of tension and there's sudden release, explosive laughter. And a, and a horror film is kind of the same timing, same release, only it's a scream. So uh, I always felt like, uh, you know, I used to I used to write comedy for Liz Torres. You know, I, I wrote her comic act, so it's like that was second nature to me. It, it, making people laugh is much more second nature to me than uh, making people scary, uh, you know, afraid. It's like I never thought I would be doing that, but the skills, I think, the skill set is very similar. So, um, it, no, I didn't find any difficulty doing it, and I must say it was an excellent script. Um, and I also just found some really great actors, and especially Jamie Kennedy, who I could just kind of let go. You know, almost every scene we did one take where he just went, <clears throat> and I just kind of went with it, you know. But also Matthew Lillard was, was quite brilliant in improvisation. There was a famous moment when uh, Nev has escaped, and she calls up, and he's totally bloody, bleeding to death because their stupid, you know, way of getting out of being suspected was completely backfiring, and they were bleeding to death. And, he says, did you really, uh, you know, did you really call the police? And she said, yes. And he just says, my mom and dad are going to kill me. And that was just his line, you know. And it's just like trying not to laugh, you know. And so stuff like that just comes from sometimes from actors. It just comes from everybody kind of like putting their best ideas into things. But the studio heads did not think everyone was putting their best ideas to work. The first week of shooting was the Drew Barrymore sequence. And... Um, I think it had been a while since I had directed, you know, and I'm always thinking, am I too much of an old fart? Can I not do this anymore? Who knows? You know, <laughs> you never know. And uh, so it was a week of shooting. We did a lot of steady cam moves and everything else, but you never, you know, you think you're doing your thing. You think it's going to work, but you don't know. And um, on the Monday of the second week, I get a call from, uh, let's say, the studio. Uh, and, they, and the studio person said, um, Bob Weinstein, um, pretty well known they did this. Nobody's going to tell you except me. I looked at your dailies, and they're just workmanlike at best. You're phoning it in. I'm not hiring you to phone it in. <laughs> it's like, I just felt my blood run cold. You know, I was like, oh, God, is it that bad? So I was like, you know, it's like Bob Shea turning around and saying, do we have a film here at all? And, and what, what I should have thought of, but, you know, no matter how many times you experience it, is that people that don't make movies, they can't look at dailies, you know? It, it's impossible for them to know what you have in your mind as far as how it's going to be cut together. So the, the second week of shooting was this frantic behind the scenes, uh, you know, cutting it together by my brilliant editor, Patrick Lussier. And, you know, we had special music uh, made and we sound effects, we did a whole mix, sent it to Bob at the end of the second week of shooting, total exhaustion, figuring I'm going to get fired. I get the call from Bob and he says, I saw your footage. It's brilliant. It's fucking brilliant. What do I know about looking at dailies? I'm taking it to can. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Bob. You know, it's, um, he can he can uh, you know totally make you nuts, or he can uh, you know support you and throw in tons of money and make it even better once he's once he has faith in it. So um, you know, my experiences with uh, that guy were all over the planet. I mean, from some of the worst experiences I've had to some of the best. And it just seems to be the way, the way he makes movies. But it was pretty, it was pretty, hor pretty horrible, uh, you know, end of the first week. But when Weinstein was finally on board, he fought for this film. The first scream, for instance, you know, with two guys who are the murderers and their ideas will stab each other, so we'll look like victims and they'll never suspect us. And then they start bleeding to death, you know, because they're two jerks that don't really know what it is to get hurt. Uh, and they're covered with blood and talking you know, for a 15 minute scene. The censors said, basically, you just have to remove it. I don't know. We don't know how you're going to make your story make sense, but you can't have it in your movie. And I wrote all sorts of, you know, this is a First Amendment issue. And finally, uh, Bob Weinstein uh, called him up and said, it's a spoof. It's a spoof. We're just making fun of it all. I swear to God. The next day, we got an R. And we had to cut one little thing. There was a shot of Matthew Lillard's hand, and it was blood dripping off the end. And at that particular time, it was, you can't show flowing blood. So we trimmed that like 10 frames, and we got an R. So it's like the whole censorship thing is so incredibly arbitrary and unpredictable. 
You can never cite precedent. You're lucky if you get the same group of people to look at the film twice. The box office success of the first Scream led to a very successful trilogy, but not without some apprehension. There was a, a sort of a, a sort of encroaching craziness on the way it was uh, um, put into motion by the studio. The, the second one, no, the third one, uh, Columbine happened just before we were to uh, start work on it. And uh, understandably, the Weinsteins called us up and said, we're not sure we should do this, you know. And there was this whole, horrible, you know, whole controversy all over again of, uh, you know, horror films make kids do these things. And I mean, you know, two years later, they find out the kids had horrible parents and all these other things. But people immediately point to horror films. So and, and um, Kevin's uh, outline was, uh, you know, was set in a high school. And uh, the plot was that um, this girl and a group of friends was killing people. And she was the principal's daughter. And it was like, that's not going to happen. <clears throat> so um, I just said, you know, I, I think the third one should take her to Hollywood and just complete this sort of, you know, referential look at film itself. And so we put that in motion. But, um, you know, it was already late. And so we were, there was a lot of writing while we were shooting, um, actually, on both the second and third. Um, the second one was our first experience with the sort of threat of the internet uh, and spoilers. I had never heard the term before. I think it was pretty much when they were emerging. But Kevin sent us 42 pages of a really brilliant uh, opening for the second film. And the next night, it was on the internet, you know, in format, the whole damn thing, which just killed us, you know, just killed us. Uh, so all you little spoilers out there. Um, so uh, we had to go back and you know reconceive the whole damn film as we were shooting uh, and fighting to make some alternate ending as good as the original ending was going to be. So uh, you know the, suddenly the scripts were all numbered and they had a purple stripe down the middle. So if you xeroxed them, it came out black. And we had little we changed the word in each script so we would know whose script it was and all that stuff. You know uh, just to try to safeguard ourselves against, uh, you know, somebody publishing it on the internet. And I, you know, I have to say it's, um, I have to be very careful with what I say these days compared to what I used to say. I used to be able to say to somebody kind of in confidence, you know, this happened or that happened. But now it's like on the internet right away. And this kind of, I don't know, this kind of feeling like it's okay to just kind of try to get something out there that was told in confidence or something uh, makes it really a pain in the ass. You know, to be frank or to, you know, talk in private about certain things. So, you find yourself censoring yourself much more and being much more careful about what you say because it's just got to end up on the internet. Not that this will, but you know what I mean. Especially during press tours when you're talking to a lot of reporters and stuff. Craven won't let anyone spoil his creative genius. He continues to make brutally honest horror films, which puts his audiences through an emotional ringer. His vision cannot be matched and his passion remains his greatest inspiration. So again, the business is like, it tests you, it really tests you, and you just have to, uh, you just have to say, uh, I don't give a damn what happens, I've got to do my best to make one more film, and that's, all, that's what I do. I'm just an animal that makes films, and maybe they won't let me do it after a while, but as long as I can, I'm going to keep making films. The dog that has a flashback, <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, everybody says, you can't do that, it's stupid. And I guess it was, but I, it's still the only uh, dog flashback that I know of in cinema. <laughs> we didn't have money to, to shoot enough to fill a 90 minutes of film, so <laughs> that would give me another five minutes of, you know, by showing that sequence from the first film. Uh, so uh, I just thought, uh, let's do it, screw it. You know? <clears throat> sometimes that works, and sometimes people end up just thinking you're stupid for the next 30 years. <laughs>